All right. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me here at the conference. It's a great pleasure to talk about something we do every single day. Well, how many of us here are programmers? All right, I'm in the right place. So one of the things we deal with every single day is deal with complexity. And that's what I want to talk about. How do we really deal with complexity and stay sane? Well, I was on the flight uh, uh, at one of the travels I was taking. I was sitting next to a gentleman. And we were having a small talk. And he asked me, what do I do for my living? I said, I'm a programmer. And he said, that's the easiest job on Earth. I said, well, that's great to hear. But can I ask you why you think it's the easiest job? And he said, well, that's because all you have to know is zeros and ones. I said, you're absolutely right. But you know why they pay is the big bucks they pay? And he said, why is that? He said, because only we know in what sequence to put them together. Well, the point is, that's where the complexity really comes in. How do we really deal with complexity? Well, in this room, I'm going to say we have probably one of the most complicated things ever, which is the brain that each one of us have. And the human brain is probably one of the most complex things. It's extremely capable. But there is something really funny about the human brain, though. It's as complex as it is, as capable as it is, it also is one thing that gets tangled up. We get into this analysis paralysis. We get tied up, and we're not often able to make decisions very clearly. And, and the question is, how can we deal with and comprehend all the complexities that we have to deal with every single day? And that's what I want to focus on. Well, one of the things I often do is, I, I travel a lot, but the times I get to spend with my children, it's a lot of fun to talk about fun stuff. And one of the fun stuff we often talk about in my family are things like Schrodinger's cat. And Schrodinger's cat, of course, is this experiment, a mental experiment, where Schrodinger says there's a cat stuck in a box. You can see through it. You cannot listen to it. And there's a vial in the box. And the question is, is the cat alive or dead? And of course, a lot of things we do in our lives kind of fits into this Schrodinger's cat. And I'm going to say simplicity is one of them, as we will talk about in here. Well, I'm going to talk about simplicity here, but Confucius said, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. Now, the question, of course, is why? Why do we want to make things complicated? Now, I'll tell you why. I, I think I know some of the reasons why we do it. The first reason why we make things complicated is it feels really good. When you make things really complex, it feels good, honestly, doesn't it? You do something, you show it to your colleague, your colleague looks at it and says, yeah, this is simple. You feel let down. You say, let me come back tomorrow. And you go with a different design. And your colleague looks at it and says, my gosh, I can't understand it. And it feels good, isn't it? Because we want to create something complex, we feel we are worthy of it. There are several reasons we create things complex. One of the reasons we create things complex is it improves our job security. If there's any time a layoff in the company, what do they say? Whatever you do, don't touch Joe, because nobody understands what he is doing. So if you create things complex, you get on to hold on to your job. You know, I always tell companies, when you hire interns from the university, when, they, when the students of the university come and work the summer job, don't send them back to the university alone. Go with them and watch them when they go back to the university and they talk about the work, the summer work, in their, among their own students. And here's what you would hear them say. You know the company I worked for in the summer? Those people are genius. I understood nothing of what they do. So that's another reason why people love complexity. But unfortunately, though, while it is so much joy to create things complex, it also hurts us. We're not able to produce results. Our speed of development reduces, and things, things become really hard. So as Einstein put it really nicely, he said, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. And in this, I would say, probably the most important word I want you to focus on is not the word genius, but it's the word courage. Because a lot of times, courage is probably the most important thing to create things that are simple. 
When you sit down in your office, when you are in the design meeting, you will be ridiculed by your colleagues. They would tell you, this is not worthy, what you're doing is not worthy, because this is too simple. And it takes courage to really stand up and say, no, this solves the problem we understand. I'm not going to make it any more complicated. So the courage is something extremely important for us to carry through. But the real problem is, what is really simple? And I'm going to ask the question, if simple was sitting next to you, would you even recognize that this is simple? And this is one of the things that really uh, dawned on me, is that every one of us want to create things that are simple. You go to your colleagues and say, do you want to create something complex or simple? And they would kind of laugh and say, of course I want to create something simple. So the problem is not that we don't want to create things simple. The problem is most of us don't know what simple really means. I was working with the team uh, a couple of years ago, and I was complaining almost endlessly that their code was really complex. After about 15, 20 minutes of hearing my complaint, one of the developers in the room said, oh, excuse me, Venkat, you keep saying our code is complex. We all collectively think it is simple. And I said, oh my gosh, how would you think this code is simple? And one of the developers said, let me tell you why it is simple, and he said, because all we are using is a simple if and else statement. So why should it be complex then? And that's when I realized a lot of us don't understand what simple really means. In that particular example, the problem was not that they used a simple if and else statement. The problem is those if and else statements were duplicated 70 times in that code. And that code was duplicated hundreds of times in the application. And that's increasing the complexity of the code in terms of how we maintain it. So a lot of times we don't think about what complex really is or what simple is, even though we all have the desire to make things simple in the end. So the question to answer is, what is really simple? But as it turns out, that's really hard to answer. So I'm going to take a different approach right now. Instead of telling us what simple really is, I'm going to focus on what simple is, what is not simple. And maybe if we can find what's not simple, maybe we can avoid those things, and in the end, maybe we'll move towards simplicity. So let's talk about a few things that are not simple. Well, the first thing I'm going to say is simple is not clever. Raise your hand if you have never written a clever code. Yeah, nobody raised the hand, because we all have written clever code, isn't it? Why do we write clever code? Because when you write clever code, a proverbial hand comes and pats you in the back and says, you are awesome, isn't it? You go home and say, mom, I wrote this code, it was brilliant, and nobody understood it. And mom says, I know you're going to be brilliant one day, right? It feels good to create clever code. When you create clever code, what do you do? You don't create clever code and quietly walk away. You create clever code and show it to a colleague and say, do you see what I do here? And they look at this and say, wow, does it work? And you're like, yeah, but how does it work? And we then spend the time, and they're trying to figure it out. And this takes sometimes a while to figure out, and we feel so good about it. But unfortunately, what happens when we create clever code is we tend to forget the cleverness after a while. And we look at this code and don't have a clue why this code is working. And it becomes really hard to maintain this code after a while. Like, for example, take a look at this one here. What is that? It says class enum, E extends enum E. That is implementation of enum in Java. Oh, the noise you just heard? That's your brain throwing an exception. Because you're like, huh, what does that mean, really? That's the example of a cleverness, isn't it? I'm sure it solves some problem, but it's not intuitive. And you're staring at it, trying to figure out what in the world does it mean. Oh, by the way, I came across this code right in here. I'll show you in a second. Well, clever code is self uh, simplicity, and clever code is self uh, obfuscated, or not simple code is. Now, I, when I go to companies, often people tell me, we want to know how to obfuscate our code. 
And I always kind of wonder, I ask them, why do you want to obfuscate your code? Because your programmer have a natural tendency to create self-obfuscated code. They themselves cannot understand the code after they write it. So there's no reason to obfuscate the code at all. And, and this becomes really hard. Like this code I came across a while ago. Now, float in square root, float x. Isn't that so beautiful, x? Now, how many programmers have you seen do this? They so beautifully named their variable p, or a, or k. I mean, will you do this? Will you name your child p? Hey, child, what's your name? P? Is that your initial? No, that's my full name. So what does that mean? When a child has a name like that, there's only one proof to it. Both the parents are programmers. Because if one parent was a programmer, what will happen? The other parent would say, what do you want to name the child? How about P? Are you crazy? Oh, never mind. Let's give a good name. But if the, both the programs are programmers, honey, what do you want to name the child? I'm thinking of P. Oh, I love it. That's how it happens, isn't it? We don't give such names to people. Why do we give such names to variables? Well, what's the name of this variable? X. I don't know what X means, but I got a great news for you. Whatever X is, we have half of it, X half. And then, of course, don't tell me you don't understand this code. This is so beautiful, isn't it? With an ampersand and a minus and a shift. But here comes the real charm of this. Doesn't matter what this code is, we eventually return X. Now, how do you know what this code is doing? And, and somebody, remember, took this to the heart. Remember how they tell us object-oriented programming models the real world? Well, this person took it to the heart and decided to write a flight simulator like this. Now, my question is not that this person wrote the code like this. My question is, where were the adults when this person was writing the code? Because when somebody writes a code like this, somebody else has to walk to this person and say, dude, we don't do this around here. Because we believe in writing production code and maintaining the software. And imagine you have a bug, and the boss is asking you, are you done yet? And you open a code like this. I don't think it's going to be funny on that day, isn't it? So that's very clever, but not simple. So simple is not clever. Well, what is, it, uh, what is it also not? Simple is not necessarily familiar. And I want to emphasize this because a lot of times when we learn something new, I'm sure you will notice you saying this to your, yourself, you'll notice others telling you this. When you look at something new, you'll hear people say, oh my gosh, that's complex. How many times I cannot tell you People have looked at Java 8 streams and functional programming and telling me, oh my gosh, that's complex. What they mean at the time, and I always remind developers and I ask them, did you mean the word complex or did you mean the word unfamiliar? It's very important to understand the difference between those two. What is familiar? Familiar is something you have seen several times over. And that is what familiar is. You've seen this over and over and over. It's like the in-laws. You've seen them a lot of time. They're familiar to you, but you won't use the word simple when you talk about them. But on the other hand, unfamiliar is something you haven't seen before. It's strange. It's new. And it's a human tendency to look at something unfamiliar and conclude it is complex, which is quite unfair and unfortunate. So when you look at something, when you or somebody else tells it's complex, just pause and ask the question, is it really complex or is it unfamiliar? If something is unfamiliar, it might be complex or it might, might be simple, but we can't make the judgment yet because we are unfamiliar about it. But familiar things could be complex as well. Let's look at an example of this really quickly. You know, if I post this question and say, what is it? Anybody knows what that is? Yeah, it's simple. If you know the language, you would have said immediately it's simple. If you don't know the language, you're going to look at this and say, gosh, that looks really complex. But it is actually simple, uncomplicated, casual, common. You say, my gosh, how do you know all of this? I use Google Translate. But the point really is 
that you can find out what these things are and you can say, oh, that's what it really means. But that looks complex to the uninitiated. I haven't seen what that is. That looks strange, but not complex. It's unfamiliar. Let's take a look at an example really quickly here. Let's say I want to compute the total of 10% discount of all the prices that are greater than $20 from a list. How do I do that? Let's do something that is very familiar. So what am I going to do for int i equal to zero? And then what do we do? i less than prices dot, hmm, is it size, length, count? Well, we cannot agree on one thing because that would make the world simple, isn't it? Java would use size for a list, but length for an array. JavaScript would use length for an array. On the other hand, they would use size, or they would use count in the case of Ruby. Why can't we just agree on it? And then when you do this, what is the next thing you do? Then you pause and ask the question, is it less than or less than or equal to? Do you ever ask that question? Every single time. When people ask me, what is that symbol? I tell them, that's the symbol, international symbol for confusion. Because every time you type that, you pause and say, huh? Is it less than or less than or equal to? You're trying to do the bounce check in your mind. And you write the code, and you stare at it. Is it really less than? How does it make you feel? It makes you feel stupid, isn't it? Because every time you write it, you pause and think about it. Now, this is an example of a code with a lot of moving parts in it. Then you do prices.get at i, and you say, if it is greater than 20, then what do you want to do? You would have to create a result over here. So double, and you say double result is equal to zero. And then you come in here and say, result plus equal to, and then prices are get at i, at times you wanted a 10%, so you would say 0.1. And once you get that value out of that, what is the next step? Well, you will keep looping through it for every single value, and then in the very end of this, you can print the result and see if that is the result you are getting. But if you look at this code, is that a simple code? No, it's very important to realize it's not a simple code, it's a familiar code. In fact, it's a very familiar but complex code. So when people use the word simple versus complex, we often confuse the words familiar versus unfamiliar. And just reminding ourselves a minute to say, did you really mean simple or did you mean familiar? Did you really mean complex or did you mean unfamiliar? can change the direction of our conversation quite a bit. But given this, of course, that's a simple problem, but not, not a simple solution, a familiar solution. On the other hand, we could try to solve this problem in a very unfamiliar way if we are new to functional programming. So what we could do is we could say output, we could start with the prices given to us, and then we could say stream, and then we can do a filter on it. Given a price, we can say, give me a price that's greater than 20. Then we can map to a double, and we can say, given a price, give me the price times 0.1. And then we could perform a sum operation on it to get the final result of that particular call. And so when we go back and run this little code, we can get the output. But this becomes an example of maybe an unfamiliar code, but definitely simpler. But why is it simple? The reason it's simple is the code has fewer moving parts in it. It's got fewer moving parts. You're not sitting there and asking, is it less than or less than or equal to? You're not asking for the size. You're not iterating over a hypothetical index you have to deal with, a perceived notion. Instead, you directly work with the values in the collection, and the code begins to read like the problem statement. Given all the prices, get me all the prices greater than 20, uh, give me the uh, discounted price for each of them, and total, the code begins to read like the problem statement. All of a sudden, we're not dealing with the complexity. So don't confuse familiar with simple and unfamiliar with complex. We need to clearly draw the boundaries of them and set the conversation straight. And a lot of us are familiar with imperative style, but declarative style and functional style is a lot simpler than that. And simple has fewer moving parts in it. 
You know, today you saw those wonderful people come and juggle. And, and there was somebody who was very absolutely brave uh, to put himself on the floor while these people juggled over this person. How many of you in this room can do what they did? Not many people raise the hand. I can actually tell you, every one of us in this room do this every single day. You know what that is called? Programming with mutability. That's what you do every day. You are juggling. Your users are sitting and watching your code like this. The way we watch them is the way our users watch our code execute. And they're like, when is this going to fail? Because we are the jugglers of the world, the programming world. Because when you deploy your application, the world comes to a pause. And they're like, what's going to happen? And when it works, they all clap at us, which is very sad, isn't it? Because we should write predictable code, which is simple to make easier to maintain, but we are the jugglers. That's why they get excited when our code actually works. And, and, and so the point really is, mutability is one area where we see this happen quite a bit. The complexity, the accidental complexity comes into the code. Simple is not over-engineered. We tend to do this quite often. We tend to create code which is way too complex because we want to solve the tomorrow's problem, which, by the way, we haven't really understood. And this reminds me of an experience I had once. I was working on a project. I was reading a piece of code a developer had written. And this code literally took a data from a database, 250 lines of code, to convert this data into an XML format. And I'm reading through the code, wow, went from this data to XML, got it. Then I saw where that function is called from. I'm not kidding with you. That function took this XML document, parses it, another 250 lines of code, does a little work with it, and puts it right back into the database. And I'm sitting and scratching my head. Okay, let me understand this. The data went from here to XML, from XML back to the database. So I went to the developer who wrote this code, had spent days writing this code, and said, hey, dude, I'm looking at this code. You took that data, brought XML, parsed, parsed it back, little work, and then you put it back into the database. Before I could finish my sentence, he said, isn't that cool? I'm like, no, it's not cool. Well, Venkat, you should have a vision. I said, I'm sorry, what kind of vision should I really have? He said, Think about it. I said, I'm, I'm struggling. Help me here. He said, well, the beauty of this code, there's beauty in it. The beauty of this code is that data can come from anywhere. And that data can go anywhere. I said, wow. In our application, where does the data come from? Here. Where does it go to? Here. Then why are we talking about anywhere? He said, no, 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 no. You need to have a vision of the software you create. And as he was saying it, I dialed my phone. He said, hello. I said, hello. He said, excuse me. Yeah. Is it you, Venkat? I said, yes. Why in the world are you calling me from in front of me? I said, you should have a vision. I could be anywhere now talking to you. So we should never talk to each other in person anymore. We should always use the phone, even when we are straight in front of each other. Well, the point is, what problem are we really trying to solve? Let's implement a solution to solve real problems, not perceived complexities that make it really hard for us to maintain the code. Well, back in time, Rube Goldberg created a lot of comic strips that highlighted complex design. In school in the US, children build Ruth Goldberg designs these days. And I always look at them. My children go through school, and as part of their project, in one semester, they have to build something enormously complex to solve a problem. I always admire the children's uh, you know, effort, and I tell them, I'm so glad your school is preparing you for the real world. Because when you graduate, this is exactly what you do at work. Create monsters, nobody can maintain it. But, but here's an example of Rule Goldberg machine, where this is a very complicated design to create a fancy back scratcher. But well, this looks really funny. Honestly, a lot of us have created this in code. And we look at this code and say, how does it work? And somebody says, it's called miracle, right? We don't even know how all these moving parts got together and made things work. And simple is not terse. 
I want to distinguish between two words in here. A word which is called a terse, I want to just put that here, but the word also is concise, and it's important not to confuse between those two words, terse versus concise. Concise code is short, easier to understand, easier to work with. Terse code is also short, but it's waiting to hurt you, and it's really hard to understand it. We want to create con concise code, not terse code. So here's an example. I was working for a client of mine when I was doing code reviews, and this developer brought a little code, and he switched over to another screen. I said, excuse me, can you go back to that other window? He did. I said, do you mind if I take a photo of it? He said, yeah, go ahead, but promise you never tell who we are. So promise I will never tell who this company is. But this product is a very complex engineering product. A simple mistake in this product potentially could be, lead to design flaws that may possibly result in human life loss. But the reason I wanted to take a photo of this particular page was I was drawn into this code in production. This code was in production. What I took photo of was not this line. It was a line right below this line, left in production code. It said something along the lines of, God, help me, I have no idea what this means. <laughs> this was code left in production. And I looked at the developer and said, why did not anyone remove this commented line? He said, we left it out of respect for the person who wrote it. And, and, and this is kind of scary, isn't it? When your production code will have comments like that left behind by somebody who maybe quit years ago, couldn't take this anymore. And this, this is the kind of code we create, how hard it is to maintain things. That is not concise code, that is a terse piece of code. Something ready to hurt everybody who has to work with it. And these are the people who understand the domain but cannot maintain the code because they have no clue what L1, L2, and then when they ran out of the three, they went at P1 and P2 and P3 with vengeance in this case. But the question really is, you know, here is an example of a try with a max profit and a fail. This is a very old way of writing unit test. What is wrong with this unit test? It's verbose, you may say. Well, how about writing it like this? In this case, you say test expected and rod cutter exception, and you write it. But this is a terse and not a concise code. I would not allow this on my, on my teams. The reason I won't allow this is you cannot tell which of those two functions really failed. I want a unit test to pass for only the right reason, and it has to fail for every other reason. It should never pass for the wrong reasons. So what do you do to solve this problem? Go back and write a verbose code, or in JUnit 5 and, and tools like that, you can use a lambda expression to make it really concise. So it's important to look at a solution and ask the question, is it concise or is it terse? And important to really choose what is concise and not choose what's terse. So don't confuse a terse with concise and simple code. Sometimes we get excited to create terseness, which is actually complex. A beautiful quote by Tony Hoare, he says, there are two ways of constructing a software design. One way is to make it so simple that there are obviously no deficiencies. And the other way is to make it so complicated that there are no obvious deficiencies. So sometimes you can create the code so complex that nobody even knows if things are broken, and if it is, where it is broken. Well, I talked about what is not simple, but it would be unfair to leave this talk without talking about maybe what is actually simple. So I want to give you some examples of what is actually simple. So what makes code simple? One is a simple code keeps your focus. And, and simple things keep your focus. There is one thing in short supply today, and that is retaining the attention of our own self. We live in a world constantly being uh, uh, drawn away using Twitter and Facebook and all the other distractions. And to keep our attention is very important. If you can come into a piece of code or a software or a tool and if it can keep your focus rather than being distracted, that is pretty awesome. Let's think about this for a minute. Imagine you are sitting and working, and you want to make this new API call, but you quite can't figure out what function to call. You're thinking about it, you're struggling with it, you're not sure what to call. 
what do you normally do? You say, let me search for it, which is a normal thing to do, isn't it? Why would you want to waste a lot of time trying to find a solution that only 20,000 people have posted about? So you're going to search. So how do you search? Well, to search, of course, you want to bring up your browser. So the minute you bring up your browser, what's going to happen? Let's give it a try. I'm going to bring up Yahoo to do the search. And the minute I bring up, I want to search this API. Oh, wait. Very interesting. Look at this. Hey, they talk about Jeopardy fans in uproar over big spoiler. <laughs> Did you know about this? That's kind of funny. Oh, I wonder what Prince Harry wants to talk about my president. This is amazing. He called somebody nasty. Hey, that's pretty interesting news. Let's see what else is here. There's so many, whoa, interesting news after all. You know what just happened, isn't it? I completely got distracted. I don't remember what API I really wanted to search. And after all these beautiful news, reading these news, I then moved to my editor. Oh, darn it. That particular API, I still haven't figured it out. Let's give it a try one more time. Let's go to Bing. Hey, that's nice. Wow, that's cute. Does anyone know what that is? Well, why don't you search for it? You know what? I'm really scared. Because if I search for it, what if a picture comes which is different, and I don't know what that picture is? I would end up searching for that. That's called recursion in our field, isn't it? Hmm. Let's try this one more time. Hey, here is Google search. What can I do? It says, search, you stupid. What else can I do? I want you to think about this for a minute. Don't assume this is easy. I want you to close your eyes for a minute and imagine that day at Google's office when this developer walked in and said, boss, I've got the search page ready for you. And the boss says, let me take a look. And this developer posted that and said, there you go. And the boss says, are you kidding me? I don't see anything. Aha, I know you will say it. That's why I put, I'm feeling lucky. Well, you should feel lucky for having this job. <laughs> Honestly, how many of us in this room will have the courage to create that? Very few, honestly, isn't it? To stand up and say, that's my search page. Are you out of your mind? No, that's called simplicity. How many of us will have the courage to say, I am not going to pollute this? Don't get me wrong. Behind that button is huge amount of complexity. AI, machine learning, servers, cloud, talk all the fancy terms you want to talk about. They didn't take all of those and said, we're going to make you suffer because of that. Instead, they distilled it to something absolutely phenomenal. You go in, and it's got your focus. If you want to know what they tell about Trump and nastiness, Google for it. They're not going to distract you by things they don't provide. What did they do? They created something simple so they could keep something extremely valuable, your focus. How many of us use Google for searching? There's a reason, because you care about your time, and that's exactly what it is. And that takes courage, that takes effort to do it. And, and so the point really is, simple keeps your focus. This is one of the reasons why I'm a huge fan of pair programming. There's a beautiful term in our field called yak shaving. We all do yak shaving. Why do we do yak shaving? Because it's so much fun to solve a problem we create than the real problem given to us. So here's how the yak shaving works, isn't it? You're sitting and working on your computer. You're not sure what API to use. You bring up your browser. And what does the browser say? Would you like to upgrade? You're like, sure. And you click on it. Now you get an error, error upgrading. You're like, darn it. Why doesn't it upgrade? And you're spending a little time trying to fix it. You're not sure. In the meantime, Sarah comes to you and says, Sarah says, hey, I'm working with this code. I'm not sure how it works. Can you help me? Well, Sarah, if you can fix my browser, I'll go fix your problem. Deal. 
So Sarah is on your machine, you're on Sarah's machine. And you're trying to fix a problem she's having. And you run into another problem, what do you do? You look at Joe, and Joe says, if you fix my problem, I'll fix her problem. And then a few hours goes by, and the boss opens the closet and looks at you and says, what are you doing here in the closet shaving this yak? And you're like, boss, I don't know how I got here. I remember having this API issue. I remember opening the browser, and everything else faded from my memory after that. It's not clear who even brought this yak to work today, but this is a nice yak if you want to shave and give the blade and walk away quietly. Well, where do, how do we get to yak shaving? Because we want to solve a meta problem rather than the problem we are solving. But when you pair program, what happens? You're sitting next to somebody, you're writing code, and your colleague says, what kind of API can we call? You know what, I'm not sure. Google for it. You open the browser. Would you like to upgrade? Your colleague is like, <clears throat> oh no, not now. That's not important at the moment. Let's keep our focus on the problem we need to solve. So you want to really keep the focus, but one way to do that is to create things that are simple. So beautiful quote here by uh, Antonio uh, uh, the Saint Exubery, he says, Perfection is achieved not when there's nothing more to add, but when there's nothing left to take away. So it's what you can remove, not what you can add, that often matters. When people ask you, what can I do more? My question is, what can you do less? What can you remove? If you can remove complexity, I, when I go to client side these days, oftentimes when I go to companies, they ask me, what did you do over there? It's usually, what did I undo over there? Because when I leave, they have less code than when they did when I walked in, because I see they are struggling with complexity, and I try to rem help them remove it. So simple eliminates accidental complexity and hides the inherent complexity for us. So simple fails less. That's one of the things you want to do, is to fail less as much as you can. You, uh, let's take a look at an example of this. If I ask you, why is the shape of the main hole that way? I think most of us will be able to quickly answer it. And the answer we will give is, oh, it's like that because it doesn't fall into it. Yeah, you're right. But let's reverse the problem. I'm going to give you a request for proposal in your consulting company. And I'm going to request your proposal. Build me something, design me something that doesn't fall in. I bet you we will not come up with a circle. Because all of these shapes that are listed over here have the property. None of these fall in also. And the chances are we'll design one of these. Why? Because it'll give us more money in the contract. It looks fancy, isn't it? It looks clever. It looks awesome. The circle is boring. So if we were given the problem, design something that doesn't fall in, we probably will come up with this. But there's another reason why the circle is like this. And the reason is, not just it doesn't fall in, it fits the same no matter how you roll it on. Imagine at the end of the long day, everybody comes out of it. And the last guy who comes out of it says, wait, wait, guys, wait for me in the truck. I need to cover this. But how do I fit this in? Roll the damn thing over, we are done. That is simplicity. So it becomes a lot easier, it fits the same, no matter how you roll it on. That's another reason. So simple is easier to understand, and it is easier to work with as well. So to give you an example of this, I wanted to find out if a number is prime. And is prime is gonna tell you whether a number is prime, but I wanna find all the prime numbers. Here's the code, primes starting. If the number is prime, concatenate it with all the numbers that follow it that are prime. Otherwise, just return all the prime numbers that follow it, skipping that number. Well, unfortunately, this code won't work. Because if you run this code, you will get into a, a Stack Overflow exception if you try it the same way. But I want to do this a little differently. But I can use the Java streams, for example. And I can call the iterate function. And I can achieve the same level by using an infinite stream. And, and the question is, this idea of infinite stream can be used for many different purposes. Well, let's talk about what that could be in just a second. One other trait of simple is, simple is elegant. So what is elegance? Elegance is something really hard to achieve in the beginning. But elegance is simple, easy to understand, we appreciate it, easier to work with as well. 
Why do we all look at this and say, wow, this is a masterpiece. We celebrate the artist. We celebrate this painting. But why? Because the beauty is in simplicity. What does she have? Nothing. No distractions. No fancy ornaments. No fancy bangles. Nothing jittery and cluttery. And that's natural. And the guy is a genius because he applied simplicity. And that is the reason why this is a masterpiece. And it takes genius and courage to do that, as Einstein said. And that's why we appreciate this, is the sheer beauty is the beauty of simplicity. And that's why we appreciate this so much. But I'll talk to you about an architect's dilemma. I was visiting Boston with my family. I was walking through the downtown Boston. If you ever get a chance to visit our reefs at Boston, I encourage you to do that. And when I did this, I'm a big fan of simplicity, and I fear complexity. But I was drawn to something I could not take my eyes off. I was walking by, and I came across a beautiful church called the Trinity Church right in downtown Boston. The Trinity Church is like any other church. You may look at this and say, yeah, why are we so drawn to it? Actually, I was not drawn to this church. What mesmerized me was something completely different. In the downtown next to this church, a company, John Hancock, wanted to build a huge construction. They applied permit to the city, and the city said, no, we will not allow you to build here. Because if you build here, the beauty of the church will come down. So sorry, no permit for you. The architect of the building challenged the city and said, no, we will build here. And when we are done, the beauty of the church will be even better. And he got the permit to build, and he did. And that's what drew my attention. Because what absolutely drew my attention was the building next to this church. I didn't even know this church was there in the beginning. And I saw the reflection of the church in that building. My camera hasn't done a good job here, in my opinion, because I was standing there for so long. I was that guy standing right here, looking at this, until my family said, you better move or we're going to call the cops on you. Because this was so admiring, I'm like, wow. I don't want to leave this building. I want to see this. This is a work of a genius, isn't it? Because all he did was to plant it in a way, in an angle, with the proper reflection. So the church is reflected by the building, and it only enhances the beauty of it. And, and what if we can think of simple solutions that can get our way through? But simplicity has to evolve. You cannot sit down and create something simple in one sitting, or even in many sittings sometimes. As Richard Feynman said, if you cannot explain something to the first year student, you haven't really understood it. And understanding something is first, and then we remove complexity and make things simple. But an example I want to mention to you. Uh, Occam's Razor says, if you have two equally likable solutions to a problem, choose the simplest one among them. And I was writing the book on Java 8, functional programming in Java. In the, I, I normally write my books in about two weeks. I don't have time. I travel a lot. But the week of Thanksgiving and the week after are absolutely brilliant. Because nothing happens in the US during the week of Thanksgiving. So this is my tradition, usually. I would go home after my travel. The week of Thanksgiving, I would decide what book I want to write. And I would literally shut my door and lock it. My very kind family literally would slide food under the door. And for two weeks, I wouldn't shave. Hygiene goes through the door. And every minute I'm awake, I would just keep typing, and I would write the book. And, and one of those sessions in those two-week period, I started writing a book on Java 8. In the middle of writing this book, I got inspired to say, what if I talk about maybe how to do tail call optimization in Java? Well, you see, Java doesn't have tail call optimization. But I wanted to do something like this, where you can use recursion, 
Well, unfortunately, the recursion will fail if the number is too big. So I've read books and looked at tools and languages that can do tail call. A wonderful book is Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. In this book, they talk about process versus procedure. A process is what you, a procedure is what you write, process is what executes. You can write the recursive procedure and it can run as a recursive process. You can write an iterative procedure. It can run as an iterative process. But the real win is when you can write a recursive procedure, but the compiler can change it to an iteration and run it as an iterative process. And if it can, then you get the best of both worlds. You get to write recursive code, but it can run as an iteration, never failing with the Stack Overflow error. And I know it works in Clojure, it works in Groovy, it works in Scala. And I'm like, wow, these languages do it. Why can't we do this in Java? And so I set out in the middle of writing the book to do this, very bad idea. But I tried to do that. And so I started, here is my recursion, and I wanted to implement this, and I spent nearly uh, two days working on it. And then I refactored the code and I spent 10 more hours on it. When I finished it, I had a code something like this. And my code said, invoke, is complete, call complete. And then while call complete, current equal to current dot apply, and I wrote this code. And three days of my life wasted. When I finished it, I looked at this code. This came after a lot of refactoring and hard work. And I looked at this code, and I was heartbroken. The reason is, look at that line within the while loop. What does it say? Current equals current dot apply. What is that? That's called mutability. You're mutating a variable. And unfortunately, until the previous page in the book, I told the reader, don't mutate, don't mutate, don't mutate. And what was I doing here? Mutating. How do we solve the problem? I came up with a brilliant solution, at least in my opinion. My brilliant solution was, dear reader, do you see I'm using mutation? I leave the task of refactoring this code to avoid mutation as a homework to the reader. This would have worked really well 30 years ago when we didn't have internet and social media. Now the minute the book is out, we'll say, oh yeah, really genius, tell us how. That's not gonna work. Then I came with the second best answer. I said to myself, let me write this in the book. Do you realize I'm using mutation? Don't use mutation, except when you cannot. That didn't go really well also. And I said to myself, I know what's happening here. I came to the grim realization, my code simply sucks. And I gave it up. I left it alone and said, maybe I'll meet somebody who is brilliant and better than me, and maybe I'll ask them for this. I'll come back to this. And a week or two went by. I was on the treadmill one morning jogging when my mind has been away from this problem for a couple of weeks now. I was thinking about it and it dawned on me, oh my gosh, why didn't they think of a simple solution? And I immediately jumped out of the treadmill, ran across the floors of my house, and I started changing the code with my children screaming, are you okay, daddy? And I'm like, I got this now. And all I had to do was apply the ideas I've learned before, which is infinite streams. Suddenly, I was able to treat this recursion as an infinite stream of function calls where every call to the filter will yield the next call to come through from here. And I want just the first one which completes. And the code didn't have any mutability. Problem was solved with almost no effort. But sometimes it takes a lot of effort to find this. So as Einstein says, everything should be made simple as possible, but not simpler. Well, is it simple or is it complicated? Well, what I've realized is I write complex code. I refactor, make it simple. Then a colleague of mine would do a, re a review of my code or pair with me and say, why are you doing this? This can be simpler. And all of a sudden, what I thought was simple was complex. And I have something simpler than I started with. It's a journey every step of the way. In that regard, I would argue, simplicity is like Schrodinger's cat. Your code is complex and simple at the same time. It is simple because you think it is. It's complex because your colleague hasn't looked at it yet. And when they look at it, they may be able to simplify it even further. And so the question is, should we strive for the simplicity after all? 
Well, simple makes things easy, but certainly is not easy to make things simple. We have to work really hard to make things simple, but every step of that is worth it. One reason it's worth it is you end up with something simple, but even more, one reason it's really important is that effort in making things simple over and over and over prepares you to handle much more complex problems in the future. The battles of today prepare you for what's ahead tomorrow. And that's one of the reasons why I emphasize we should not give it up. We should work on it and make things simple every step of the way. Because as Da Vinci said, simplicity is the ultimate sophistication in life. And it's well worth striving for that sophistication. Hope that was useful. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Venkat. Thank you. It was a pleasure. OK, everyone. So we're going to have our first coffee break. That's a long break. So please move to the upstairs um, and have some fun. <laughs> <laughs>